Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. In this episode, Dorsey interviews another special guest that will give you hope and inspire you. Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining me on another episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. Today, we have Andrew Falk with us. He created Ministry Misfit Media after seeing the state of the American Church's online blessings in the wake of the 2020 events. Andrew serves as the digital director for CSRM and the associate producer of Overwhelming Victory Flex and the director of Overwhelming Victory Radio. He is also a licensed minister and teacher. Andrew has served in a variety of leadership positions, both in the church and in Christian education, brings these experiences with him as he analyzes current trends in both sectors and the world around us. Andrew, we welcome you to the show today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking to you today. So tell us about your story. Yeah, so uh, I very quickly learned that I was kind of a misfit within uh, within ministry. I got my call to ministry when I was a teenager um, and kept telling God no over and over and over, which most people know that doesn't normally end up well for people when they keep telling God no over and over and over. Um, finally, my senior year, I said yes. Um, went to college for sports ministry, youth ministry, outreach ministry, um, and very quickly learned there that I didn't really fit the mold of what most people in ministry expect, whether that was just from my uh, my interests to the way that I dress to the way that I talk and didn't really fit in with any specific groups there in college. Um, had some difficulty in college with some uh, some of the institutional stuff going on as far as what they expected you to do if you were going into ministry. Um, and even after that, going into professional ministry after college, it's been a lot of places where we've not really ever felt fully a part of what was going on. But we've also recognized that that is actually how God's designed all of it and that obviously we must not be alone in this. And so that's where the whole idea of ministry misfits comes in of the idea of finding a community of people that actually are like you when everybody around you tells you that nobody is like you, um, especially within the church and ministry settings. So how do you, do you feel that you, you know, how do you feel that you do ministry when you feel like you're not a part of, you know, you feel like you're left out of the ministry that you do today. That's the that's the tricky part um, that, you know, I don't know that really we've still fully figured that out. Um, that's part of what the whole point of, you know, what we're doing with the podcast stuff is doing is hearing hearing the stories of other people that are also in the same situation, how they've walked through it. Um, is very helpful for me. the The big thing that we lean into is um, theology, Bible based, Christocentric theology. As far as if we understand who God is, we understand what He said, and we understand what He's called us to do. Then at that point, it's just about going and doing that that thing, regardless of what the outside you know, outside forces, outside interactions, outside comments coming in are saying, um, not necessarily an easy thing. It at times can be a very depressing thing. Um, it can be a very isolating thing, but you know, there, unfortunately the reality is that there's gotta be people like me out there in order to, uh, kind of point out some of these things that have been going on culturally within the church that make non-Christians feel the same way that, that we feel. And so if we're able to to help kind of bridge those gaps, then it, it's definitely worth it. Right. 
And I think, you know, I know you didn't interview me on, on your show at some point. Well, once we get I, this studio thing figured out, we're we're in the process. <laughs> right. You know, but I, you know, I definitely, you know, at times, you know, feel that, you know, I fit, may possibly fit that mode of ministry misfit because not, you know, not everyone accepts me, you right. know, not everyone, you know, they may say, hey, you know, you're doing a good job and, you know, you're doing a great job, but yet they won't, you know, call me in and have me in to speak or have me in to share my story. And yes, I know there's a limited time in a year to, you know, have guest speakers and whatnot, but at the same time, you know, I'm wondering, well, you know, you accept me, but yet you won't have me in at the same time. Right. It's the whole, was, you know, I'm, yeah. We approve of and, what you are doing. We just don't like the look of how it's going. And right. so because we don't like the look of how it's going, we're just going to talk about how we support you, but never actually introduce you to the congregation. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I won't talk about anything else because I don't want to get myself into, into too much <laughs> trouble here. <laughs> Yeah, I I understand that side of it. Yeah. So you, you know, you talk about that you created this ministry misfit media after the state of the American Cook's online presence in the wake of you know last year twenty twenty event. Tell us more about that, and you know what were those events that you were seeing that made you create you know this ministry. Yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, you had read in the bio, I I work for um, CSRM, which is an international sports ministry, paraministry. Um, We go into the local church and help them with developing sports rec and fitness ministries. Um, You know, and a consultation side of it, we have a resource department that I I help oversee the digital side of that. my mentor, Dr. Greg Linville, is the head of that and writes the majority of the books. And then I produce the podcasts. Well, last last year, right around, you know, when everything started going crazy with quarantine, we had one podcast out through Overwhelming Victory, which is our resource branch. Um, that was just the CSRM podcast. Um, and then, you know, we had a blog up and everything like that. And we, we started playing around with a second podcast that we now call the Tuesday Talks, where it was basically a place for sports ministers to get together as a group like we would normally, but actually over Zoom and we would discuss some different stuff. So we just recorded it. But as we started, you know, moving along through some of the stuff that I personally started seeing because my job involves me being online all the time, um, being all the resourcing that I develop is all digital. You know, it became very divided online within the Christian circles, even more so than the secular circles on things like, you know, the, the mask policies at first quarantine in general at first. And then with um, George Floyd, then all of the racial divide that started going in as far as whether or not it was social, you know, can a church actually address social justice? Can a church not address social justice? You know, even going past that into after all of the, after the, you know, all that, then is it okay for Christians to, to condemn the rights? Is it okay for them not to condemn the rights? What should they be doing there? Then you go into the election and we've got people arguing for Trump. We got people arguing against Trump. We have people arguing for Biden. We have people arguing against Biden. All of these different arguments that were going on. And the majority of the arguments I was seeing from the church was all either one extreme or the other extreme. And there was like absolutely nobody that was trying to actually calm the waters with saying, this is where we as a church are supposed to stand. This is what scripture lays out as far as, you know, we are supposed to respond to these sort of things in this way. You know, let's get rid of the political side of this and just lay out what does God actually expect of us. Um, And so Dr. Linville and I started talking about some of that stuff where it's like, we don't have anybody talking about it. And so Greg's response to me was, well, then why don't you write it? 
And so I wrote a couple of blogs that we never published because we couldn't really find a space for it because it really didn't fit with the other things we were publishing out of Overwhelming Victory. And there was no real platform for me to be doing any of this stuff. And then in January of this year, when we saw all the stuff going on at the Capitol and the church's response to it as well, at that point, we're like, you know what? We're just buying another microphone and we're doing this. You know, we we want to be able to actually look at these things going on in our culture and address them from we call it the three tier paradigm of let's lay out what what is the Christocentric theological truths. You know, what what can we identify as if Christ is the center of our of our thinking and our way of life, then what is the truth that we know from this? If that if we once we identify that, okay, how do we actually think about this from a biblical perspective? What does scripture already say about this? And if we have those two things in place, then at that point, then we know what to do about it. And we call that our method methodological models. And so we've we've been going and trying to lay out cultural all these different cultural things going on, whether it's the race stuff whether it's just division online. Um, you know, another big event that happened in 2021 already was on uh, Palm Sunday on Twitter. Christianity was a trending topic, but if you actually opened that up to see what why it was trending, it had nothing to do with the church on Palm Sunday. Instead, it was people talking about the responses that they were getting from Christians and Christianity about stuff. And it was all very hate filled as far as what these responses to them as individuals were. And so we're, we just want to be able to try to, you know, do say, say the stuff, lay it all out that a lot of pastors are not able to, for fear of losing their jobs at this point. Um, we want to be the resource for them to be able to go to to say, okay, how do I actually sit down and address this from a biblical standpoint? Strip away the politics, strip away the West, you know, the Western ideologies that we've we've got. Strip away the personal bias and just look at if we say that Jesus is Lord, and we actually believe that. And then if we look at scripture and say, this is God's word, and we actually believe that, then how are we actually supposed to act as a church? Right. And how would you, would you say that, you know, the ministry mythics that you talk about and the church itself, do you think that we could ever, you know, come together and actually work together as, you know, one or in a in unified way? Ideally, we should be able to if we all are actually doing things with the right mission in mind. Um, and that that's part of what we talk about a lot on there is that if we are actually in ministry because God has called us to it, then ideally that means that us and the local, you know, that the local churches should have that same mission of we're out here trying to reach our communities with the gospel. And so if we are both of the same mission, we should be able to work together. It's just that we've got all of these things that are non-essentials and, you know, just straight up pol political, cultural things that keep getting in the way and hindering a lot of it. And so a lot of what we are hoping to do is strip away a lot of these hindrances and actually allow for ministers to be able to actually go out and fulfill their calling and for the local churches that are employing them to be able to see the vision and get behind it and to actually make an impact in their local community. Um, you know, nothing that we're doing is because we're saying the church is, you know, unsavable, unforgivable, or everybody just needs to stay away from the church. You know, everything that we do within CSRM and Overwhelming Victory is about equipping and empowering the local church and the local minister. We love the idea of a local church, a local congregation. It's just a matter of we need to actually be able to see them empowered with the gospel and with the vision that God's given their leadership to actually be able to start to see community change happen. Right. You mentioned, you know, you you talk about a Bible verse, 2 Timothy 4, um, chapter 4, verse 5, and it says, but for you, be serious about everything, endure hardship, do the work an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And you go on to talk about 
you know, about pastors and about ministry leaders that feel like they don't just feel, um, fit the mold of what the American church expects them to be and within the culture and, you know, what, whatever it be, like what they look like, what they preach like, even like what they think like. Mm-hmm. You know, tell us a little bit more about that and what you what you think about that, what, what your vision is for that. Yeah, so um, 2 Timothy 4 as a whole is kind of where I've always wrapped my ministry around, and that's where Paul is charging Timothy. You know, Paul, Paul is in prison. Paul is pretty sure he's not getting out, even though we know he, he does get out of this one. Um the chapter right before this is where um, Paul lays out for Timothy the power of Scripture and the power of you know even remembering how Scripture impacted the people in Timothy's life. And so he starts out with this idea of you know Scripture is powerful, it's important, it's God breathed, it's useful for teaching, correcting, training, and righteousness, rebuke, all of those. And then immediately he goes into so you then go and preach this message, whether it's con- convenient or not. Endure the hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So, you know, Paul is telling Timothy, look at me. I'm sitting here in a jail cell, pretty sure I'm not getting out, about to die. Why am I in this jail cell? It's because of the fact that I've been preaching this gospel message for, you know, the past however many years and now I'm telling you with my last my last bit of advice to you to go and do the exact same thing that got me locked up in here. And do it because of the fact that you are called to fulfill the ministry that God has called you to. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is provide that same kind of encouragement to whether it's pastors that have been in the ministry for a long time and just still kind of feel out of place, whether it's the pastors that have been that are just coming into ministry and aren't really sure where to go because they're being pulled in multiple directions, whether it's for the people that are just not sure about what to do with, you know, maybe not even a pastor, they're just a member in the congregation, but they have this desire, this holy discontent is the wording we use a lot to do something in their community, but they're not sure exactly how to go about it. And so that that's kind of where we're coming in. So, you know, we, I personally have experienced as a youth pastor and as a senior pastor and as an outreach pastor, this idea of where there are people that will automatically write off what I have to say or the vision that God's given because of the fact that I'm wearing a t-shirt and jeans and sandals or, you know, in tennis shoes. Um, you know, I've, there are people that will go and write off a pastor if they don't have a Southern accent. There are people that write off a pastor if they have a Southern accent, um, because they're the cultural perspective of all of that. Um, you know, why are you not in a suit and tie if you claim to be a preacher? You can't be a preacher if you don't look like Billy Graham up there, you know, slamming the Bible down over and over and over. Um, why don't you only, why do you only use King James? Why do you only use ESV? Um, you know, why, how can you claim to be a pastor and say that you care about, you know, how can you be a pastor and claim that you care about the Black Lives Matter movement if, you're a pastor, you shouldn't care about that. How can you claim you're a pastor if you don't care about that? There's all of these different things that start getting, you know, we get pulled and pulled and pulled, but the reality is that anybody that is called into ministry has had a specific calling placed on their lives by the Spirit to go and do the work that God's designed them to do. And so nobody's ministry is going to look the same. And when we expect everybody to fit this cookie cutter mold, that's where we start to get things like, you know, the fakeness, the fake, the fake smile pastor at the front of the the service. You get the the pastors that are so stressed out from trying to fit all of these different things that they burn out real quick and they only last a couple years. You know, we we start to see even some of the scandals and things that we hear about you know, coming out of churches, if the pastor was actually allowed to express, you know, things like he's struggling with something 
you know, he, you know, whether it's depression, whether it's out, whatever it is, he's struggling with something. He can't even express that and try to get accountability or help from his congregation, because if he expresses that he loses his job and now his family is right. homeless. And so yeah. these are the kind of things that we want to start addressing and actually allow people to start to recognize and think about, you know, the, the pastor is an individual member of the congregation as well but he's an individual that has a calling placed on him by God. And he needs to be able to fulfill that calling that God's placed. Amen. You know, you talked about earlier, and it's almost like, you know, you talked about different, you know, even in this, um, you could talk about how we view people. And it's like, even yesterday I was talking to somebody and they were like, I'm not going to go back to church, especially if, you know, they're forcing you to wear a mask. And yeah. I don't, I'm not going to wear a mask anymore. And, you know, I'm going to have to find a church that, you know, doesn't care about people wearing masks. <laughs> it's, you know, such a string, you know, strange time and, you know, you, everything's being stringed and pulled right. in different, different uh, ways. Yeah, and you know, and that the and the the saddest part of it is that the places that were being pulled are have nothing to do with any of the requirements that we see in scripture for what qualifies a minister. We right. have has nothing to do with even well, the majority of it has nothing to do even with actual essential theology, and the places that do involve essential theology things like you know amago dei every man is made in the image of god that should be something that every church is able to accept but because of the political spectrum of all of that we can't even necessarily fully expect that every church is going to agree on what that actually looks like and means in a, in a, in today's context because if you preach that every man is made in the image of god and so we need to care about it at that point, you could be labeled a socialist. If you don't preach that, then everybody assumes that you're no longer pro-life. If you only, but so you have to then at that point pick and choose. Okay, what qualifies? This person is made in the image of God, but this person isn't. You know, one of the biggest places I saw that um, was again online, especially where pastors and churches that one month we're talking about how, well, this virus only kills 1% of people. So why are we worried about it and shutting down? You know, why are we quarantined if it only kills 1% of people? But then a month later are now all up in arms saying, well, no, all lives matter. Well, which is it? Is it that all lives matter or that it only kills 1%? So obviously that means that 1% of the population doesn't really matter. Which is it? Is it all lives matter or 1% matters? Or is it just that it inconveniences you? And so we don't like it. And at that point, it's not about theology. It's not about, it's about this impacts me and normally politically or culturally. And so I cannot experience what I want to experience. But then we try to justify it all with horrible theology. And when we right. do that, that's and that that's the part where, you know, especially from a pastoral place, it it you know, at times even almost angers me to see people try to twist scripture to fit a political narrative instead of allowing scripture to show us what God actually has in store for us. Yeah. Would it be easier, do you think, to just to keep the politics out of the church to become more unified? I think it would be helpful to have an actual biblical understanding of politics back in the pulpit, which at that point means that, you know, we're not claiming that the Republican Party is God's chosen party. We're not claiming that the Democratic Party is God's chosen party. We're not even at that point claiming that America is God's chosen people. And instead, we're looking at it from the fact of we as a church understand that we are exiles here on this earth waiting to be called home. And so what is it that we see in Scripture that exiles are supposed to do? We're supposed to, you know, settle down, plant 
seek the prosperity of the city that we're in. We're supposed to pray for our leadership. We're supposed to submit to authority. We're supposed to preach the gospel. We're supposed to go out and make disciples of all nations. Nothing involved with that identifies with either political party. We have to address some of these political things because it's a part it if we're if we're called to seek the prosperity of the city, we need to know what's going on in the city that we're in. But we're coming at it from a perspective of this is how we are able to impact our city f- with the gospel, not a this is how the city is going it's going to benefit me from living in this city now. And that that seems to be where a lot of the disconnect comes in. Um, one of the episodes that I did with um, the Hunka family, I believe it was episode 13 or 14, um, Corey laid it out the best I, I've ever heard of. You know, we're called by Christ tells us to be salt and light in our communities and in our nation. Salt is a preserver. It's conser- it conserves things, which, you know, we, we do well if those that are on the conservative side of the spectrum. Light drives away darkness is a very active and it, it allows for things to develop and it casts out fear and it casts out all these systemic oppressions and things like that, which is very much what, you know, a more liberal sided party is more focused on. But God doesn't call us to be one or the other. God calls us to be both. We're supposed to conserve what is good and drive out what is bad and show the gospel to the community around us. And that is much more of the political side of things that we need to start seeing is pastors that are willing to say, this is a problem within our society. And this is what the gospel says for us to do about it. Amen. As we get ready to end, I usually ask my guests to just to give us an encouragement, encouragement word about, you know, even with what we discussed about, you know, coming together and, you know, allowing the ministry mythics to become part of those, you know, part of the church world and, you know, almost like accepting us. You know, if you would just give us, you know, encouragement word and, you know, unifying us to become, you know, part of the church again. So the f- the first part of that would be that you aren't actually as out there and alone as you think you are. There are more of us out there that are thinking this way. It's just that most of us aren't given a platform to do it, um, which is why I just went ahead and created one. Um, the other side of it is actually, you know, I'll, the encouragement that Paul gives Timothy is to, you know, preach the message, to be consistent in it, even when it's not convenient, to do the work of an evangelist, or what we, the phrase we use is an evangelistic disciple maker, to endure the hardship, to endure the turmoil, to endure the weird looks and weird comments, and then to fulfill your ministry, regardless of what that looks like or what people assume that it is fulfill the ministry that God's actually placed on your life. You know, you were talking there, you just mentioned, you know, weird comments. I, I you know, I'm an evangelist, you know, a itinerant speaker, you know, however you want to title it. And I was out speaking one time and I had family, my dad was there and I had other family members. And like, I must have missed it or went over my head or something and the minister was like, yeah, Dorsey will never become a, a singer pastor, you know. And apparently a lot of my, you know, family members were very upset, you know, about that comment. Not that I would ever think, you know, think about that, you know, but it was just, you know, one of those comments mm-hmm. that, you know, hit you in the gut type type of thing. Is there a way, you know, maybe for people, you know, like myself or others that listen to this later on and they feel like an outcast or they feel like they don't belong to somebody and they were like, hey, I want to connect with Andrew because I feel like he does and maybe I can connect with him to, you know, 
become better in ministry, how can they connect with you? Yeah, so first of all, to whoever it is that would be saying that to you, the majority of senior pastors I know that are actually effective in their ministry never wanted to become a senior pastor. And comments like that are part of the reason why they never wanted to become a senior pastor. Um, so that's just a side note. Um, oh, getting a hold of me. That's what you said. Yeah, getting a hold of me. Um, I am on pretty much all the social media channels. Um, you can check out our Facebook page at Ministry Misfit. Um, we're on Instagram, Twitter, and tip TikTok at Ministry Misfit. Um, don't add the S because somebody had already taken that and I'm just a little bit bitter that we couldn't get ministry misfits. Um, the easiest way to get a hold of us also would be, um, we do have a website, but I haven't paid for a domain name yet. And so it's really long, but you can get a hold of us if you start, if you go to bio.link backslash ministry misfits, um, that has a link to everything that we do. Um, it's also on our Facebook page. Um, if you're wanting to get a hold of me personally, you can do that. Um, my email is ministry misfit media at gmail.com, or you can find me at CSRM. Um, if you're wanting to talk the sports ministry angle of all of this, um, the digital ministry ministry angle of all this, you can find me at www.csrm.org. Awesome. Well, Andrew, thank you again for, you know, coming on the show. We greatly appreciate having you. Thanks for having me. This was good. Yes, definitely. Well, guys, thank you again for joining me on another episode of the Dorsero Show. Please like, share, you know, follow, download, however you want to, you know, continue to follow this show. And, you know, you can even go on the website and donate to this, you know, podcast and to the ministry as well. Until next time, have a great day. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you again for joining Dorsey Ross on this episode of The Dorsey Ross Show. Please like, share, and tell others about the show. Also, please check out the other podcast episodes. And if you would like, donate to this podcast and buy Dorsey a coffee. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode.